Hello, my name is Dr. Sunanda Kane, and I'm an assistant, sorry, associate professor of medicine here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, um, part of the Mayo Clinic Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center. I want to talk a few minutes about Crohn's disease with you. So Crohn's disease is a condition whereby there's uncontrolled inflammation of the GI tract. I have a particular interest in taking care of women who want to get pregnant, who are pregnant, and then issues around the time of birth and then also breastfeeding later. So first of all, it's really important to have a, a good nutritional start. And sometimes that means taking prenatal vitamins well before you're thinking about getting pregnant. Uh, prenatal vitamins have extra iron and other nutrients, and so they're very good vitamins just in general for patients with Crohn's disease. So uh, that the fertility rates in women with Crohn's is slightly lower than in the normal population, but not so much. And really what's driving that statistic are women who are trying to get pregnant when they have active disease. And whether it's known active disease or hidden active disease and nobody's just picked it up, that's probably what's driving some of that statistic. So I, I tell my, my female patients, look, you know, as long as you're healthy, that, that there isn't a decreased chance of you getting pregnant. And what's important to understand is that up, up to 7% of couples in the U.S. are infertile for some reason or another. And it has nothing to do with Crohn's disease. So just knowing that, there's still a chance that you won't get pregnant. It has nothing to do with your Crohn's disease. If you get pregnant, then the, the, the key thing to remember about pregnancy is to stay healthy through that pregnancy. And how do you do that? You stay on your medicines that got you healthy. So the, the, the amount of disease that you have when you conceive is what's going to prognosticate that pregnancy. And what does that mean? It means that women who have inactive disease or are in remission at the time of, of conception have no greater risk for an adverse event or a bad outcome or a disease flare than a woman who is not pregnant at that time. If you have active disease at the time of conception, then we talk about the rule of thirds. A third of women will get worse, a third of women will stay the same, and a third of women will actually get better. And I've had patients come and say, listen, Dr. Kane, the only time I've ever felt well is when I was pregnant, and I'm in a flare, so I'm gonna get pregnant to, make, to treat my disease. I tell them that that's not a very good idea. And the reason is because every pregnancy is different, just like every child is different. And so you can't prognosticate based on what's happened in the past. So again, it's really important that you're well when you conceive. So let's say you conceive and maybe you weren't so well. It's very important to tell your doctor, both your gastroenterologist and your obstetrician, that you are having active symptoms and that you are pregnant because it, it requires very aggressive treatment to get that disease under control from the get-go because it's really in those first few weeks to a few months that the, all the organs of the fetus are, are developing and that's when the risk for, for birth defects and congenital abnormalities is, is at its highest. So you want to make sure that if you have active disease that you are getting aggressive treatment. And what do I mean by aggressive? I mean that maybe you wouldn't otherwise be on steroids or you wouldn't otherwise be getting more of a biologic therapy that you're taking, but we definitely want you to be well and, and get well as fast as possible. Sometimes that means hospitalization, but usually not. So if you're well and you get pregnant, then whatever medicines you're taking that got you well, you stay on to keep you well. And I know that there's lots of concern and fear about some of these medicines. What's it going to do to my baby? Well, I'll tell you that active disease is much worse for your baby than the medicine that you're taking. Most medications, while they cross the placenta, are in extremely minimal amounts and that the exposure to the baby is really minimal and not of any consequence. And we do have data to show that the drugs and the doses that we use for Crohn's disease are safe or, or what we would consider low risk for, for pregnancy and that some of these drugs are used at much higher doses for other, cons for other diseases, and it's at the higher doses that there may be problems. But putting into context the doses that we use for Crohn's disease, 
that these drugs are very effective at keeping disease under control and do not impart a, an increased risk for a bad outcome to that baby. So what do we do with a woman who is on maybe say Remicade or Humira or Simsia, one of the biologics during pregnancy? Well, it turns out that those biologic agents do cross the placenta, but they do not cross the placenta in an effective manner until the third trimester. So late in the second and into the third trimester. So stopping the therapy in the first trimester is the wrong thing to do. That's when, again, there's gonna be the least amount that's gonna be transferred to the baby, and that's the time when you're at most risk for flaring and for having a, having a, a congenital abnormality develop in the baby. So it's the most important time in that first trimester to stay on your medicine. It's in the second and third trimesters when the baby's already formed and is just growing that consideration for scaling back or even stopping some of your therapies until the time of delivery is reasonable. And again, every patient is different, just like I said. So depending on your health history with Crohn's disease, that you may need to see a high-risk OB. It may not be the case. If this is your third baby and you've had very minimal amount of Crohn's disease and you've been well, then there's, no there's not a necessary reason that you have to be seen by high risk. I get asked all the time about, well, do I have to have a C-section? And as it turns out, there are a lot of women in the U.S. who have C-sections for non-medical reasons. It's just more convenient or it's fear of the obstetrician because you have this, this label of Crohn's disease. But really the only time that a C-section would be mandated in Crohn's disease is if you've had fistulas or perianal disease. So problems around your actual anal canal where there's been fistulas, there's large hemorrhoids, there's been skin tags. That's the patient who's at risk for having difficulty with healing if there's an episiotomy or if there's a tear during the vaginal birth process. So those are the patients that we recommend have a C-section. But if your disease is well up into your small intestine, uh, into your colon, but doesn't involve the anal canal, then if you want to push and you want to have a vaginal delivery, then that's okay. What about nursing? So a, a lot of people are concerned about drugs getting through breast milk into the, into the fetus and into the baby, the newborn baby. Well, it turns out that, that if you're on a biologic, that those biologics don't cross into br breast milk. And so you can breastfeed or nurse if you're taking one of the biologic therapies that if you are on a drug like Pentaza or Asacol, so the five ASA products, that a little bit crosses over into the, into the breast milk, but very minimal amounts and not enough that would cause problems to the nursing baby. And we know that there's so many benefits to nursing um, and, and plus just the, the bonding that goes on there that I never discourage a woman from nursing if she wants to. Um, the medications that you can't nurse with would be antibiotics. Um, but if, if you're on a, a biologic, you can certainly nurse. The 5-ASA products you can. And then there's controversy about Imuran and 6-MP, but it turns out that the amounts that are secreted are very minimal. And there's very good actual um, scientific data to show that the, the highest concentration is going to be that first milk in the morning. So what we have patients do is take their drugs at night and then in the morning they pump and they dump their first milk of the day and then they breastfeed the rest of the day because the amounts, if, if they're measurable at all, are so minuscule that even if you accidentally nursed with the first milk of the day, that again the levels are so minuscule that it does not appear to have any effect. But if you really want to be safe, for both you and your baby. You don't stop your therapy. You just use the science that we know to minimize that, that chance of exposure to your baby. Again, biologics not found in breast milk. What about the chances that you pass this along to your baby? So I get asked all the time, well, should I really get pregnant because I don't want my children to get this? Well, as you may or may not know, there, there are some genes that are associated with the increased risk for developing 
Crohn's disease. And that sounds like I'm a lawyer saying that, um, but what that means is that this is not a genetic disease like you would think about sickle cell or cystic fibrosis, where there's a very specific gene that's deformed. And if you, if you inherit that gene, you get the disease. It doesn't work that way in Crohn's disease. There are a family of genes that seem to be more prevalent in patients who have Crohn's. So there's a genetic predisposition to this condition but it's not that just because you have it that you're gonna pass it along to your children. What is the risk that it, that the, the risk is thought to be about 7%, which is pretty low. So that if, if you're a mom with Crohn's and you have a baby, the risk or the chance of your baby having Crohn's is only, as, is only about 7%. If the father of the child also has Crohn's disease, that chance goes up to somewhere in about 40% range. So it's still not even 50-50. So that's how we know that this isn't a truly genetic disease like some other genetic diseases are. So the, the, the chance is not 100%, but we do know that family members do impart a higher risk. If there are several family members in the family that have the disease, it's still, per individual, only 7%. So. What have I covered? I've covered the, the issues before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and then after pregnancy. Do you need to be seen by a high-risk OB? Well, it's never a bad thing to just have a consultation with one if, you, if this is your first pregnancy, if for some reason um, you are, have had a, a complicated Crohn's course, then it's not a bad idea. But again, it's not mandated that you be followed by high risk just because you have Crohn's disease. Should you not get pregnant? I, I never tell a woman that she shouldn't get pregnant unless she's in a bad flare or if she's on a medication, which we haven't talked about yet, that actually is bad for pregnancy. And that, and that medication would be methotrexate. Methotrexate is used to treat some patients with Crohn's disease and it is known to cause abortions. So if a woman is on methotrexate, she has to be off of it and treated with something else for her Crohn's for at least three months before she should get pregnant. And guess what, guys, too, that it's damaging to sperm. And so males who are interested in fathering children should be off of methotrexate for three months before they uh, consider fathering children. But methotrexate is really the only outstanding ex um, exception to the rule about medications. All the others would be considered rather low risk because stopping medicine and having active disease is far worse on the baby and its development than the medications used to control the disease.